Nimrod. Strangely, the dispersion of tribes at Babel Babel should be connected with the name of Nimrod, who figures in biblical as well as Babylonian tradition as a mighty hunter. Epiphanius states that formed the very foundation of the city, Babylon, there was an immediate scene of conspiracy, sedition, and tyranny carried on by Nimrod, Chas Ethiopia's son. Around this dim, legendary figure, a great deal of learned controversy has raged. Before examining his legendary and mythological significance, let us see what legend and scripture say of him. In the book of Genesis, he is mentioned as a mighty hunter before Yahweh, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. He was also the ruler of a great kingdom. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalne, in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Ashur, that is, by compulsion of Nimrod, and builded Nineveh, and other great cities. In the scriptures, Nimrod is mentioned as a descendant of Ham, but this may arise from reading his father's name as Cush, which indicates a colored race in the scriptures. The name may possibly be Cash and should relate to the Cassites. It appears then that the sons of Cush or Shus, the Cassites, according to legend, did not partake of the general division of the human race after the fall of Babel Babel. Still, under the leadership of Nimrod, he remained where they were. Nimrod built Babylon and fortified the territory around it. It is also said that he built Nineveh and trespassed upon the land of Ashur, so that at last he forced Ashur to quit that territory. The Greeks gave him the name of Nebrod or Nebros. They preserved or invented many tales concerning him and his apostasy concerning the tower he is supposed to have erected. He is described as a gigantic person of mighty bearing and a contemner of everything divine. His followers are equally presumptuous and overbearing. In fact, he seems to have appeared to the Greeks very much like one of their own titans. Nimrod has been identified both with Merodach, the tutelar god of Babylon, and with Gilgamesh, the hero of the epic of that name, with Orion and with others. According to Petrie, the term has even been found in the 22nd Dynasty's Egyptian documents as Nemart. Nimrod seems to be one of those giants who rage against the gods, as do the titans of Greek myth and Jotan of the Scandinavian story. All are earth gods, the disorderly forces of nature, defeated by the deities who stood for law and order. The derivation of the name Nimrod may mean rebel. In all his later legends, for instance, those of them that are related by Philo in his De Gigantibus, a title which proves that Nimrod was connected with the giant race by tradition, page 51, he appears as treacherous and untrustworthy. The theory that he is Merodach has no real foundation either in scholarship or probability. As a matter of fact, 
the Nimrod legend seems to be very much more archaic than any piece of tradition connected with Merodach, who indeed is a god of no very great antiquity. Abram and Nimrod Many Jewish legends bring Abram into a relationship with Nimrod, the mythical king of Babylon. According to legend, Abram was originally an idolater, and many stories are preserved respecting his conversion. Jewish legend states that the father of the faithful originally followed his father Terah's occupation, which was that of making and selling images of clay, and that, when very young, he advised his father to leave his pernicious trade of idolatry by which he imposed on the world. The Jewish rabbins relate that his father Terah, having undertaken a considerable journey on one occasion, sold the images devolved on him. It happened that a man who pretended to be a purchaser asked him how old he was. Fifty years, answered the patriarch. Wretch that thou art, said the man, for adoring at that age a thing which is only one day old. Abram was astonished and the exclamation of the old man had such an effect upon him that when a woman soon after brought some flour as an offering to one of the idols, he took an axe and broke them to pieces, preserving only the largest one into the hand of which he put the axe. Terah returned home and inquired what this havoc meant. Abram replied that the deities had quarreled about an offering which a woman had, page 52, brought upon which the larger one had seized an axe and destroyed the others. Terah replied that he must be in jest, as it was impossible that inanimate statues could so act. Abram immediately retorted on his father his own words, showing him the absurdity of worshipping false deities. But Terah, who does not appear to have been convinced, delivered Abram to Nimrod, who then dwelt in the plain of Shinar, where Babylon was built. Nimrod, having in vain exhorted Abram to worship fire, ordered him to be thrown into a burning furnace, exclaiming, Let your God come and take you out. As soon as Haran, Abram's youngest brother, saw the patriarch's fate, he resolved to conform to Nimrod's religion. Still, when he saw his brother come out of the fire unhurt, he declared for the God of Abram, which caused him to be thrown in turn into the furnace, and he was consumed. A certain writer, however, narrates a different version of Haran's death. He says that he endeavored to snatch Terah's idols from the flames into which they had been thrown by Abram, and was burnt to death in consequence. A Persian Version the Persian Muslims allege that the patriarch, born in Chaldea after God had manifested himself to him, proceeded to Mecca and built the celebrated Kaaba or temple there. When he returned home, he publicly declared himself the prophet of God. He specially announced it to Nimrod, king of Chaldea, who was a worshipper of fire. Abram met Nimrod at a town in Mesopotamia called Urga, afterward Karamit, and now Diabekar, in which was a large temple consecrated, page 53, to fire, and publicly entreated the king to renounce his idolatry and worship the true God. Nimrod consulted his wise men and inquired what punishment such a blasphemer deserved. They advised that he should be consigned to the flames. A pile of wood was ordered to be prepared, and Abram was placed upon it, but it would not kindle to their astonishment. Nimrod asked the priests the cause of this phenomenon. They replied that an angel was constantly flying about the pile and preventing the wood from burning. The king asked how the angel could be driven away, and they replied that it could only be done by some dreadful rite. Their advice was followed, but the angel still persisted, and Nimrod at length 
banished Abram from his dominions. The Muslims also relate that the king made war against the patriarch. When he was marching against him, he sent a person to him with this message. O Abram, it is now time to fight. Where is thy army? Abram answered, It will come immediately. And immediately there appeared an immense sun-darkening cloud of gnats, which devoured Nimrod's soldiers to the very bones. Another tradition is preserved in the East, especially referring to the casting of Abram into a fiery furnace at Babylon by order of Nimrod, which seems to be a corrupted story of the deliverance of the three Hebrews recorded by Daniel. Nimrod merely substituted for Nebuchadnezzar, as no evidence exists that Abram was ever at Babylon. Nimrod, it is said, in a dream saw a star rising above the horizon, the light of which eclipsed that of the sun. The soothsayers who were consulted foretold that a child was born, page 54, in Babylon, who shortly would become a great prince, and that he, Nimrod, had reason to fear him. Terrified at this answer, Nimrod gave orders to search for such an infant. Notwithstanding this precaution, however, Adna, the wife of Azar, one of Nimrod's guards, hid her child in a cave, the mouth of which she diligently closed. When she returned, she told her husband that it had perished. Adna, in the meantime, proceeded regularly to the cave to nurse the infant. Still, she always found him suckling the ends of his fingers, one of which furnished him milk and the other honey. This miracle surprised her, and her anxiety for the child's welfare was thus greatly relieved. As she saw that heaven had undertaken the care, she merely satisfied herself with visiting him from time to time. She soon perceived that he grew as much in three days as common children do in a month, so that fifteen moons had scarcely passed before he appeared as if he were fifteen years of age. Adna now told her husband Azar that the son she had been delivered, whom she had reported dead, was living, and that God had provided miraculously for his subsistence. Azar went immediately to the cave where he found his son and desired his mother to convey him to the city, as he was resolved to present him to Nimrod and place him about the court. In the evening, Adna brought him forth out of his den and conducted him to a meadow where herds of cattle were feeding. This was a sight entirely new to the young Abram. He was inquisitive to learn their nature and was informed by his mother of their names, uses, and qualities. Abram continued his inquiries and desired to know who, page 55, produced the animals. Adna told him that all things had their Lord and Creator. Who then, said he, brought me into the world? I, replied Adna. And who is your Lord? asked Abram. She answered, Azar. Who is Azar's Lord? She told him, Nimrod. He showed an inclination to carry his inquiries farther. Still, she checked him, telling him that it was not convenient to search into other matters because of danger. At last, he came to the city. The inhabitants he perceived deeply engaged in superstition and idolatry. After this, he returned to his grotto. One evening, as he was going to Babylon, he saw the stars shining. Among others, Venus, which was adored by many. He said within himself, Perhaps this is the God and creator of the world. But observing some time after that, this star was set. He said, This certainly cannot be the maker of the universe, for it is not possible he should be subject to such a change. Soon after, he noticed the moon at fall and thought that this might possibly be the author of all things. But when he perceived this planet also sink beneath the horizon, his opinion of it was the same as in the case of Venus. 
at length near the city, he saw a multitude adoring the rising sun. He was tempted to follow their example, but having seen this luminary decline like the rest, he concluded that it was not his creator, Lord and God. Azor presented his son Abram to Nimrod, seated on a lofty throne with several beautiful slaves of both sexes in attendance. Abram asked his father who was the person so much exalted above the rest. Azar answered, The king Nimrod, whom these people acknowledge as their god. It is impossible, replied Abram, that he should be their god, since he is not so beautiful and consequently not so perfect as the generality of those about him. Abram now took an opportunity of conversing with his father about the unity of God, which afterward drew him into great contests with the principal men of Nimrod's court, who would by no means acquiesce in the truths he declared. Analogies with the Flood Myth Interestingly, Sisythrus, the hero of this deluge story, was also the tenth Babylonian king, just as Noah was the tenth patriarch. The birds sent out by Sisythrus strongly recall the raven and dove dispatched by Noah. Still, several American myths introduce this conception. Birds and beasts in many cosmologies provide the new world's nucleus, which emerges from the waters that have engulfed the old. Perhaps it is the beaver or the muskrat which dives into the abyss and brings up a piece of mud which gradually grows into a big continent. Still, sometimes birds carry this nucleus in their beaks. In the myth under consideration, they return with mud on their feet, which is obviously expressive of the same idea. Attempts have been made to show that a great difference exists between the Babylonian and Hebrew stories. Undoubtedly, the two stories have a common origin. The first Babylonian version of the myth dates from about 2000 BC, and its text is evidently derived from a still older tablet. It seems likely that this was, in turn, indebted to an even more archaic version, which probably recounted the earliest type of the myth. This, perhaps, related to how the Earth and its inhabitants were not to the Creator's liking and how he resolved to recreate the whole. Therefore, the great ocean dragon was called in to submerge the world, after which the creator remolded it and set the survivor and his family upon it as the ancestors of a new human race. It is possible also that the great sea dragon or serpent, which was slain by the creator, may have flooded the earth with his blood as he expired. There is an Algonquin Indian myth to this effect. In an old cuneiform text, in fact, the year of the deluge is alluded to as the year of the raging serpent. The wise man who takes refuge in the ship or ark is warned by a dream of the forthcoming deluge. In some North American Indian myths, he is warned by friendly animals. The mountain, too, as a place of refuge for the ark is fairly common in mythology. Babylonian Archaeology Until about the middle of the 19th century, our knowledge of Babylonia and Assyria's history and antiquities was extremely scanty. The deeply interesting series of excavations that unrolled these ancient civilization circumstances before the almost incredulous eyes of learned Europe are described at length towards the close of this volume. Here we may say shortly that Layard and Bada's labors at Nineveh convinced antiquaries that the remains of a great civilization awaited discovery. Layard's excavation of the library of Ashurbanipal was the first great step toward reconstructing the two kingdoms' ancient life. He was followed by Apert and Loftus, but the country's systematic excavation was yet to be undertaken. 
This, as we shall see, was commenced by George Smith of the British Museum. But unfortunately, he died on his way home from the East. His work at Nineveh was taken up by Mr. Hormuz Rassam, who succeeded in unearthing inscribed tables and bronze gates in bas relief. A few years afterward, Mr. Rassam discovered the temple of the sun god of Sippara at Abu Habba to the southwest of Baghdad. An important find by de Sarzak was that of the diorite statues of Gudea, the Patasi, or ruler of Lagash, about 2700 BC, the stone of which, according to the inscriptions upon them, have been brought from the Sinaitic Peninsula. The University of Pennsylvania sent Mr. J. H. Haynes in 1889 to excavate at Nippur, where he unearthed the remains of the great temple of Enlil, in the heart of which is a mound of bricks stamped with the names of Sargon of Akkad and his son, Naram Sin. The German expedition of 1899 explored the ruins of Babylon, the palace of Nebuchadrezzar, and the site of Ashur. The Tower of Babel Many attempts have been made to attach the legend of the confusion of tongues to ruined towers in Babylonia, especially to Isagela, the great temple of Merodach. Some remarks upon this most interesting tale may not be out of place at this point. The myth is not found in Babylonia itself, and in its best form, it may be discovered in Scripture. In the Bible story, we're told that every region was of one tongue and speech mode. As men journeyed westward from their original home in the east, they encountered a plain in the land of Shinar, where they settled. In this region, they commenced building operations, constructed a city, and laid the foundations of a tower, the summit of which they hoped would reach heaven itself. It would appear that this edifice was constructed with the object of serving as a great landmark to the people, so that they should not be scattered over the earth's face. The Lord came down to view the city and the tower. He considered that as they were all of one language, this gave them undue power. What they imagined of themselves under such conditions, they would be able to achieve. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence over the face of every region. The building of the tower ceased, and the name of it was called Babel, because the people's single language was confounded. Of course, it is merely the native name of Babylon, which means gate of the God. As the scriptures pretend, it has no such etymology. The Hebrews, confusing their verb Balal, to confuse or confound, with the word Babel. The story was no doubt suggested by one of the temple towers of Babylon. Over and over again, we find in connection with the Jewish religion that anything which savors presumption or unnatural aspiration is strongly condemned. The ambitious effort of the Tower of Babel would thus seem abhorrent to the Hebrews of old. The strange thing is that these ancient towers, or ziggurats, as the Babylonians called them, were intended to serve as a link between heaven and earth, just as does the minaret of the Mohammedan mosque. The legend of the confusion of tongues is to be traced into other folklores than that of Babylon. It is found in Central America, where the story runs that Xinhua, one of the seven giants rescued from the deluge, built the Great Pyramid of Cholula to besiege heaven. However, the gods destroyed the structure, cast down fire upon it, and confounded its builder's language. Livingstone found some such myth among the African tribes around Lake Nagami. Certain Australian and Mongolian people possess a similar tradition.